Good morning, everybody, and welcome to a quick look at uh, fuel planning policy for EASA and the CEA, for that matter, at the moment. It's a bit in isolation. Normally, we do this in the middle of the revision weeks, um, but it's worth looking at on its own because some people get confused uh, about what actually they need to do for the, uh, the exams. Um, if you've uh, seen some of the webinars, and I remind you that all this stuff is in the webinars, all these lessons are on the webinar for you to look at in your own time and you can pause them and then go back. So for the more complicated stuff, you can go over it again and again and again. Um, the first thing is I always approach this and say it's uh, fuel planning for YASA and the CEA is a bit like the Starship Enterprise. Every time you think, well, I don't do it that way and I didn't do it there. And my instructor said so and so forget it. Just say I'm on the YASA Enterprise, the CEA Enterprise or whatever. But just remember, if you start deviating and trying to bring something into the question that's not there, then you start bring, uh, doing extra work and wasting time. So the actual regulations are laid down in uh, the acceptable means of compliance, which is what the AMC means there. And it's uh, part of CAT OP MPA 150 brackets B fuel policy. And that's been brought across into the CA as well. So nothing has changed. And that's where you can find the references. Uh, we have progressed slightly from the aircraft in the uh, uh, in the uh, picture there, although for some helicopters is exactly the same. Now, it's important to understand the breakdown. Now, this sounds foolish, but they've actually started to look at definitions or what's included in certain elements of the fuel policy itself. So first of all, we'll start off with taxi. Now, taxi fuel includes the engine start, the push back and hold, and the taxi to the end of the runway. Also within the taxi is the APU burn. Now you have to watch out on the questions because some questions give you a fuel burn for the taxi fuel itself, and some fuel, they also give you the APU burn. Now, unless they give you a time for the APU burn, that's just there to make you think you have to use it because logically, the APU is only on until you have your engines going and you have your generators going. And before that, normally you'd have your ground power as well. So your APU is not going to be burning for the length of a 15 minute taxi. So normally you'd have say a 15 minute taxi, they give you the fuel flow and then they give you an APU burn of five minutes or something and add it in. But if they don't give you a time for the APU, you don't use the taxi time for it. Um, and that sadly, they don't make that clear in the questions. They just, they're trying to sucker you in. There are a few questions where it says the company minima is 300 kilograms. Here is the taxi time and the fuel burn. What is the uh, required fuel? Well, the required fuel minima would be 300 kilograms in that case. Now, if you do the calculations for both the taxi and any APU burn that's required, and it comes to less than 300 kilograms, the answer is still 300 kilograms because that's the company minima. If your calculation ends up being larger than 300 kilograms, then that would be the new answer. And you have to uh, understand that normally a company leaves about 10, 15, 20 minutes taxi fuel in their normal fuel planning uh, and have company minutes based on that. But if you go to somewhere that's really busy, like say Washington Dulles in summer, you could be in the taxi queue for three quarters of an hour, if not an hour sometimes, and therefore they have to add more to it. Uh, you don't have to get into the vagaries of that because operations would do that as additional fuel or just boost the taxi fuel. So essentially, if your calculation comes to less than the company minima, then the company minima is the answer. If it comes to more, then your answer is the answer to the question. So remember, taxi has taxi out fuel, it also has engine start, push back and hold and the APU. The next part is the trip fuel. And sometimes the questions are badly worded for this, but basically this is the takeoff climb. So it says, as it says on the slide there, the standard instrument departure. So in other words, if you're just going from left to right on this page, it's not going to be a straight line for the standard instrument departure. It could be going away, zigzagging, and then coming back. And there's many a time I've taken off and 20 minutes later, I'm back overhead the airfield I started from, having not progressed to where I'm going. I've just been following the standard instrument departure or taking radar vectors from air traffic control. So that is built into the trip. 
and then from top of climb to top of descent is your cruise and then you have the descent, descent from top of descent on the standard arrival procedure for instrument flying and that's going to be from uh, a waypoint or a beacon associated with the airfield and then to ending up at the initial approach fix which is the start of the approach and landing for an IFR approach so for an ILS uh, leads you out to a teardrop and onto the ILS or something like that there's lots of variations so we have the takeoff and climb which includes the standard instrument departure you then have top climb to top of descent you have the descent itself and at the end of the descent you have the approach and landing procedure at the destination airport so you can see there's various elements to the trip. Then you have the alternate fuel. So if you don't land at your destination, you have to have alternate fuel. And the alternate fuel includes the missed approach. So notice the missed approach isn't including the usual trip fuel. So if you had a question whereby you didn't have an alternate and you had some other combination in the question, you have to remember to add the missed approach fuel onto your calculations. It all depends on the wording of the question. So alternate fuel includes missed approach to destination, the climb, cruise and descent, and again it would be by Sid and Star most of the time. It's not going to be just take off and go straight to your diversion. And then the expected arrival procedure and landing at the alternate. So it's a mini sortie in itself. And then once you get to your destination, then you have the final reserve and for jet or turbine engines, which includes turboprops, then you have to have standard 30 minutes in the overhead, 1500 feet above the elevation of the airdrome. And we'll look at that in detail in a second. For piston or reciprocating engines, you only need 45 minutes and those are just standard. So you have to arrive overhead with that in tanks. If not, then you have to divert and pick up more fuel.